Good evening, everyone. My name is Frank Joseph, and I am the Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor for Queensboro President Donovan Richards. Unfortunately, the Borough President cannot be with us this evening as he is away on a missions trip, but he does send his regards, knowing that we have two very important presentations and an important vote today. Uh, he is here in spirit with all of us, and he wants you to know that these are issues that he is on top of and our office is also on top of. I would like to also thank all council members and community board chairpersons who are on the Zoom today here at our meeting. I would like to thank our representatives from the Department of Transportation, the Department of City Planning, and the New York State Independent Redistricting Commission, which will join us later on. Now to start our agenda, on September 13th, the Borough Board received a presentation from DLT and DCP on the new Open Restaurants Tax Amendment. The proposed amendment would change the laws that have geographic restrictions on sidewalk dining throughout New York City. Following the presentation, the borough president, along with the borough board, stressed their concerns in hope that the departments would return this month with answers to their questions. Some of the topics that raised issues from the board included structural dining enforcement, seasonal guidelines, a process for a complaint form, prices for street license fees, and more. After today's Q&A session, the, borough, the Queensboro Board will vote on the approval of the Open Restaurants Tax Amendment. This evening, we are happy to be joined by Al Silvestri, who is the Deputy Queensboro Commissioner of the Department of Transportation. Al is also accompanied by Queensboro Director of the Department of City Planning, Ms. Alexis Wheeler, and Benjamin Huff, who will also be representing DCP. So everyone, welcome, and we look forward to hearing from Al, DOT, and DCP. Thank you, Frank. So uh, to kick it off, Alexis, is there anything you'd like to say, or should I jump into our slides? I know everyone on the call has probably heard them several times, um, uh, so I, I won't belabor it, but um, I will go over some, some basics so we're all on the same page. But Alexis, if you have anything. Um, no, Al, I, I was just going to thank everyone again for their time today. Um, again, I know that you have reviewed a number of citywides over this past year. And so we appreciate all of the great collaboration that you guys have been willing to do with us. And so we're, we're happy to be before you this evening again, but I, I won't um, belabor anything right now. Let's jump right into the meet so everyone can get to their evenings. So thank you again, everyone. Sounds good. Could I have the ability to share my screen just so I could throw up some slides? Oh, I see. I think I have it. There yeah. we go. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. There we go. Everyone see my screen? Oops. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. So just so so we're all on the same page, um, we here we are here to discuss um, the permanent open restaurant program, uh, which the the mayor announced and the city council did vote on making a, a permanent open restaurant program. Um, launched in the in the summer of 2020, we had the emergency program. There were a lot of successes, and one thing that we heard certainly from from all the community boards um, were were some of the challenges. So, just to reiterate again, um, the idea with the permanent program, and I wish I had more answers um, for some of the specific questions that have been raised. But the idea is to build upon the positives and to kind of uh, reduce all of the negatives that we have seen, um, you know, over the last 18 months. So the main change, once again, is, is the change to the text amendment that would allow all of the areas in the city of New York to be eligible for the program. It would ease the access to the program and encourage more participation. One of the things that we heard was that there were some parts of, of Queens that were not um, just not able to, to take part in, in sidewalk dining. And, and even though DOT had that small street seat program, um, we did not see any in, in, in Queens. So this is something that, you know, a silver lining in the pandemic, 
um, we were able to to bring, and it really did activate a lot of our public space. So challenges, um, once again, you know, the clarity and consistency uh, of the rules. That's something we've heard loud and clear from the community boards. Um, as we go through, and this is really the key point, as we go through the rulemaking process, which is... Um, you know, the Citywide Administrative Procedures Act process over the next year, uh, there is a uh, public hearing component to that. Um, there is going to be um, planned outreach uh, and public forums where the community boards can weigh in directly on um, the rules, the specific rules to the, to the permanent Obed restaurants program. So as, as mentioned, um, the permanent program will retain the elements of the emergency program. So the, the sidewalk and the roadway components, but when it comes to the sidewalk and roadway, DOT will still enforce the barriers, the clear paths um, through the rulemaking process have clear guidance on ADA compliance and the police department will still enforce noise, sanitation will still, um, enforce garbage and debris issues. Um, the one thing that we've, you know, I've said several times, the change here will make it available throughout the city. The roadway program in particular will be seasonal. Um, what that exactly looks like um, is still to be determined, but um, as discussed with several of the boards, we're probably looking at something like December through March, um, where you know we're in prime snow season, uh, where roadway setups would have to be removed. So, as far as this the sidewalk seating goes, once again, ADA compliance is key, making sure that there's a clear path, making sure that everything is removable, uh, and you know both with the sidewalk and the roadway, one of the benefits of this is that the entire program would just be under one umbrella and it wouldn't be several different agencies all involved in this entire program. Um, so the pictures for the sidewalk and the roadway are kind of the gold standard for what we're looking at when it comes to the permanent program. Um, removable tables and chairs, removable barriers, seating up against the wall, only in front of the restaurant. So no longer an emergency type of setup, clearer guidelines, um, more direct communication to restaurants that apply to the program. Just to reiterate again, um, with, the, with the, the roadway cafe seating, this is the kind of that gold standard that we're looking at, sturdy barriers on the street side, but open uh, setups with no, um, you know, no plywood boxes, you know, so that you kind of create that visual connection uh, for drivers um, with pedestrians, signage, cyclists, anybody using the roadway can have a, a much clearer view, um, you know, of everything that's happening. Same thing, removable chairs, accessible seating open to the sidewalk. No fully enclosed structures. One of the, the questions that came up was um, DOB involvement. And the idea with the permanent program is that none of these will be structures. So DOB and the, the structural integrity, integrity of, of the, the setup isn't really a question because um, they're not, structures will not be allowed. Um, so as far as the, the administration goes, this is something that came up, staffing. And, and specific to that point, there is a posting up on DOT's website right now <clears throat> for a director of open restaurants and several support staff. As far as the exact number of, of people who, who will be in this unit, that has yet to be determined. The, the idea is to hire the director and then the initial support staff, and then to build a citywide unit that is commensurate with the citywide need, because this is going to be a citywide program. So over the next year, um, we will be working through, and, and I'm going to go through the timeline again, uh, a, a rulemaking process that will create a, a more detailed upfront design 
guidance package with detailed visuals for restaurants to follow. And it'll be a direct streamlined application. Everything will go through DOT. And the last point, this is a four-year license window, uh, and there will be a fee. Now, we've heard clearly uh, from the borough president, among others, that the fee should not be too much as to dissuade or keep out certain restaurants in certain neighborhoods. Um, so we are taking into account a number of things, such as how much the, the old sidewalk cafe fee was, how much... Um, you know, what, what meter parking would have pulled in from a, a given frontage. So there, there are multiple considerations uh, that the agency is, is reviewing right now in developing um, what that, that proposed fee is going to be. You know, so as we go through this rulemaking process, once again, we're going to come back to the community boards. We're going to come back to the, to the council members. Uh, we're going to work collaboratively um, with both the community boards and the council on developing the rules for this, this permanent program. So finally, um, and I try to, to hit the, the main points on here. I know everybody's probably heard this a hundred times. You might've heard me go through it um, at nauseum at, at your meeting. Um, but where we're at today is the zoning text amendment, removing the locational prohibitions, and that will then allow step two, the entire program coming under DOT and the beginning of that rulemaking process. And the rulemaking process will be twofold um, for the, it'll clean up the sidewalk cafe program, um, create new clear path requirements and design requirements for that sidewalk program. And then step two, establish the rules, the fee structure, um, for the Roadway Cafe program. So you've probably seen this before. We are at the beginning steps here. Um, the, the initial legal actions, the emergency program is still going to be in effect um, for the rest of this year and all throughout 2022. And then we'll be transitioning probably the beginning of 2023 with the, the new application process. So there's going to be a, you know, essentially a whole nother year uh, where we're going to work collaboratively with the community boards and the council. And also through the CAPA process, um, civic organizations getting out any rule changes to, to local media. There's a whole um, city charter mandated process that, that DOT will have to go through to create these new rules for the permanent program. So I know one of the, the early comments was, we don't know all the answers yet, so we can't vote on this. I just want to reiterate that today is step one. It will allow us to begin creating all of those rules so we can begin answering those questions collaboratively. So that's essentially it. Um, there is additional public input input um, uh, welcomed at nyc.gov slash open restaurants. Um, the community boards, the council, you, you all know how to reach our office and we're, and we're happy to continue talking through um, this, uh, this future program with you. So I'll, I'll kick it over to city planning now. Uh, hello, this is Ben. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so the what's before the board tonight is a zoning text proposal to remove um, Article One, Chapter Four from the zoning resolution, and you know we've talking a lot about the permanent open restaurants program. This text amendment is really just the first component of building a permanent open restaurants program. It's not a vote on whether you have all the details and like you know that have want the permanent open restaurants program. The focus on the text amendment is you know, by removing Article 1, Chapter 4, what we're removing is geographical prohibitions on where sidewalk cafes can exist. 
So these rules, like rules of sidewalk cafes existed partially in zoning, partially in the admin code for um, Department of Consumer Affairs, now Department of Consumer Workforce Protection. So by removing um, the zoning text, we're just saying that a restaurant doesn't have to have zoning to apply in the permanent program. So I'm going to go through a little quicker because you guys have seen this presentation before. Most of you have at least. Um, and we did this is very similar to what we presented at, at the borough president's um, public hearing earlier. Um, so, so the effect of this zoning text amendment, it'll allow any restaurant anywhere in the city to potentially apply as long as they can meet the appropriate setting criteria. Um, so zoning sidewalk cafes have been in zoning for about 50 years. They've been modified um, over the years um, to address different parts of the city, but it's sort of gotten to a point where it's gotten really complicated on who can have a sidewalk cafe and who can't. And certain neighborhoods have sort of been left over the out over time, um, especially when New York City created special districts, because if there weren't rules that allowed for sidewalk cafes specifically in a special district, they were automatically left out. Um, and up until COVID-19 and the, the pandemic and the launch of the open restaurants program, zoning really worked as the gatekeeper of who could have a sidewalk cafe and who cannot. There was three different types of cafes, unenclosed cafes, these are the most typical ones, um, small unenclosed cafes, which were zoned specifically for central business district areas, could only go four and a half feet out from the building line, and enclosed cafes, um, which are you know, extensions of the building into the sidewalk that required 50% transparency, but they also had to maintain an eight foot clear path as, as the unenclosed sidewalk cafes were. And so this is how the zoning regulations sort of look in action. Um, so in the dense areas of, of central Manhattan in yellow, that only allowed small cafes. In areas, uh, purple areas, you could only have small or unenclosed cafes. And in green, you could have all cafes. Uh, you, could, you could apply um, for any type. And you still also had to meet the sidewalk criteria. So this wasn't necessarily like an as of right, just because you had the appropriate zoning, you absolutely got a sidewalk cafe. You also had to meet the setting criteria um, in DCWP's admin code rules. Um, which we're proposing would move from DCWP um, to DOT. So the previous program, we had 1,224 uh, cafes citywide, mostly in Manhattan and mostly of the unenclosed type. Um, during COVID, we, we saw you know, the huge negative effect that it had on the restaurant industry as a result of a ban on indoor dining. So the city worked... Um, to create an executive order that suspended certain zoning and admin code rules that allowed for uh, restaurants um, to, you know, move shift dining outdoors. Um, we saw a lot of success, a uh, quick build out of this. Um, 11 and a half thousand restaurants have participated, certainly much more than was in the pre-COVID program. Uh, we saw a surge of outdoor dining in the outer boroughs um, that previously didn't uh, participate in the old program, and some 10,000 were using a portion of the sidewalk for their outdoor dining. Um, I think what's key to note is that two and a half thousand restaurants um, that are participating in outdoor dining will not be allowed to participate if this zoning text amendment doesn't pass. So these sidewalk cafes were either specifically prohibited from having sidewalk cafes um, were non-conforming restaurants in residential districts or were limited by just the small cafe type only. So these restaurants are really sort of in a lurch right now on whether they'll be able to participate in the permanent program, which is why we're moving forward with the zoning text amendment that would remove geographic restrictions, allow them to apply, but again, they would still have to meet the updated setting criteria that DOT is going to lay out. So sidewalk cafes uh, that are on streets under elevated rail lines, these were explicitly banned um, in zoning. We don't necessarily know why um, 
sidewalk cafes were banned. They're not directly always under the elevated rail lines. It's just the way that it was drafted, but we've seen um, many sidewalk cafes kind of pop up on the commercial corridors that are under elevated rail lines. And we've seen, you know, them do successful setups. Um, certain special districts, we have East New York and Dumbo in Queens. I know Long Island City uh, Special District has some prohibitions on sidewalk cafes, as well as College Point. Um, so this zoning text amendment would allow them to apply, but again, they have to meet the setting criteria. Um, certain special districts, um, again, these are areas they'll likely need to meet a higher clear path requirement as for you know less dense streets, but the result of this zoning text amendment would remove the prohibition of sidewalk cafes in these areas. Again, it won't guarantee that they can absolutely have it, but it'll allow them to at least apply. Uh, as well as what we've said, you know, we've been saying grandfathered restaurants. I, I think that's confused people, but I think what's better to say is non-conforming restaurants in residential districts. Um, this zoning text amendment is not going to legalize um, anyone to create a restaurant in a residential district. But for re restaurants uh, that are non-conforming in residential districts, they previously weren't allowed to apply for a sidewalk cafe. Now under this program, they will. Um, we're collapsing the types of sidewalk cafes that will be allowed to participate. So we'll be getting rid of the small cafe designation. But again, this will sort of be supplemented with the higher clear path requirement to making sure that you know, these areas can still meet the high volume of pedestrian traffic that's expected. Um, we'll also be removing um, the enclosed cafe permit. Um, so in the future, we don't expect restaurants to participate um, uh, to apply with, for enclosed cafes. Um, this served a specific purpose in the pre-COVID program, but now that we're expanding it and also allowing the roadway option, um, you know, we are kind of getting away from these sort of permanent extensions into the right-of-way of businesses. We want them to be more open, really focused on outdoor dining than really just, you know, expanding um, sort of the physical footprint of the building. Um, there were 102 of these enclosed cafes that were licensed pre-COVID. Those will be grandfathered into the permanent program. So we're not going to take away anything um, that was actively licensed in March 2020. Um, so th those will be grandfathered, but we expect, you know, in the future program to have more open and um, accessible and removable cafes. So other zoning text cleanup, um, there's a lot of definitions and cross references to sidewalk cafes that would have to be um, that that will be removed as part of the text amendment, uh, removing text that precludes operable windows that could service outdoor restaurants, uh, removing the inclusion provisions in certain texts that say that a restaurant has to operate in a fully enclosed building and clarifying sidewalk widening text to ensure that it doesn't conflict with open restaurants. So again, looking at Queens, um, we can see that, um, you know, in a lot of the commercial corridors, they have green where uh, all, all restaurants were allowed to apply for all types of cafes. Um, you can see Long Island City and College Point in red, those were specifically prohibited, um, and a lot of blue. Um, so that's because there is predominant residential zoning um, in Queens throughout the city. Um, there are a number of restaurants um, that are operating in these districts, many of them that have participated in the, the open restaurants program. Um, so we would, again, we would be allowing them to participate in the future program. So the uh, Sidewalk Cafe program in March of 2020, there were 150 cafes licensed by DCWP. Um, there were 130 unenclosed cafes, three small cafes, and 17 enclosed cafes. Um, there's been an you know, uh, many more operating restaurants um, during the emergency open restaurants program, um, so close to 2,000. But I think what you know, we'd like to highlight, there's 254 
um, in areas that were prohibited by zoning. So on the map, you can see these sort of red lines. Those are restaurants uh, that are on streets that have an elevated rail line um, and a few in the various special districts. And then there's 191 cafes in residential zoning. So our hope is, again, to move forward with this zoning text amendment that'll give the, you know, clear sign to these restaurants that they will be able to participate in the open restaurants program, but they will have to follow the guidelines that DOT is, um, you know, outlining. And we want their, you know, there's a long time, we don't expect full launch till 2023 of the permanent program. So that gives time for restaurants to kind of absorb the new um, rules and sort of make sure that their setups comply with the um, rules that are laid out. So we referred out June 21st, um, public review actually ended at the end of last week. We are still meeting with a few community boards. Um, I'm meeting after this meeting, going to Bronx Community Board 11. Um, I'll say that um, 45 community boards have voted. We, 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 before, before that, I should say we, we did about over 100 community board meetings. As many times we met with both the like land use uh, or economic development committee and then also presented to the full board. 45 boards voted, 20 boards voted in favor, 23 voted against. Um, and one had no objection and one waived their right. Um, that was actually Queens 14, couldn't really decide whether they were for or against the text amendment because they wanted to know a little bit more about um, DOT's rules at first. But again, you know, we really tried to focus that this portion of, you know, the permanent rolling out the permanent open restaurants program is really focused on re removing those geographic restrictions and we're giving it more time because we think it takes more time to really flesh out these sidewalk uh, and roadway cafe rules. Those will be coming. They have to go through the capital rulemaking process, so there will be public input on that. They'll continue this discussion on the permanent open restaurants program and sort of, you know, how we can get that to make sure that it's working for, for all the communities. Um, and yeah, so as you can see again, you know, sort of the end of 2022 is when we expect sort of the launch and, and the new applications to come in. So with that, um, we're happy to take any questions you might have. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Alan and Ben. Um, we appreciate you coming once again. I think this is the third time our office has, has seen this um, alongside the leaders and elected officials here as well. I know this is a, a two or three prong process and we're only looking at the zoning resolution right now, but um, you could imagine that before anyone wants to take a first step, people want to know where they're going and what it, and what it potentially looks like when they arrive there, when we all arrive there. So you might get some questions that are not just about the zoning, but are also about just the entire project in, um, you know, uh, completely. So for me uh, and for our office, one thing that I, I really want to ask um, is, you know, we mentioned before the borough president mentioned at the September meeting, he asked about, you know, some of the complaints that we've seen and if there were numbers, not sure if um, there are updates on those and also just uh, kind of going over some of the safety sitting criteria as well. I know he had some specifics around that. And I'm not sure if you all had a chance to go back um, and, and kind of talk that through. So um, I'll, I'll start there and then um, have one or two more questions. Sure. To go to the class members. So as far as the, as the complaint process, there will be a, a direct complaint process through DOT. You'll be able to work directly with the borough commissioner's office. We'll use our, our typical um, arts request tracking system um, and work with the borough planner and it'll go directly to the new unit, which uh, will be in charge of going out, inspecting, um, and in, in some cases issuing violations and potentially, um, you know, take more serious action against restaurants that are not um, compliant. Um, so that's, that's the, that'll be a much more direct process. I think as we go through the rulemaking process, one of the things in the emergency program is 
because this was so new and because there were so many agencies that were involved, it was difficult to figure out the the true the true enforcement uh, lengths that we could go to. Um, so one of the things in putting this all under DOT and going through the CAPA process is we will formalize the um, not only the fee structure but also the violation numbers and the the next steps that we could take um, to get rid of um, bad actors in the program. Um, so, you know, I think, I think <laughs> the community boards and the council members, I think I would hope you would agree that uh, our office is, is always communicative and you could always get us. And if there's a problem actor, um, we will, uh, you know, work collaboratively with you to address that. Um, you may not always like our answers, but we always get back to you. Yeah. Um, thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, if I could just add to that too, we presented to the City Planning Commission today, um, and that is uh, available on DCP's uh, YouTube site. Um, but, you know, we, we talked a lot more about, you know, one of the visions of this permanent program once it's launched is that DOT will have additional inspectors. They're working with their borough offices. They'll be able to respond um, to, you know, concerns of the community. Um, and then also on the technology front, you know, NYPD is still going to enforce late night um, issues, criminal behavior. Sanitation will be monitoring, you know, in charge of waste removal, but can put out guidance on how best restaurants can um, properly dispose of waste, can send infractions to them if so. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea is that we'll be able to take that information, relay it to the inspectors, work with the borough um, offices at DOT. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these restaurants will have to get a license. There's going to be renewals. There's going to be sort of an annual review that's um, mm -hmm. envisioned. And so that information will come up and, and DOT will be able to make the call. Well, if they're consistently getting, you know, late night, um, late night after our partying uh, infractions that they will be able to revoke their license. Um, right. And so we're definitely working in, in the legislation of, you know, transferring the sidewalk cafe program over to DOT that they'll have that administrative teeth um, to, to properly enforce those that are bad actors. And yeah. we do think it makes sense, you know, DOT is a larger agency. Um, they have a lot of, um, they have traffic engineers, they have people that are um, sort of focused on a lot of these concerns around safety, how these setups will work. So we think they're really well equipped to take on that inspection process more so than DCWP uh, has been in the past. They're, they're a licensing agency. They don't have as many traffic engineers on staff. Um, and so, you know, we're really working to get that together all to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank, the one thing I would just add to that is, uh, you know, in the emergency program, our focus in dealing with restaurants was education and working with them and doing our best to, to bring them into compliance um, because we didn't want to because we were in an emergency situation where restaurants were really struggling um, in the permanent program, it's, we're still going to be educating, but it's going to, to really shift towards um, clear access, ADA compliance, and making sure that they are abiding by the strict guidelines um, set forth and that they signed up for. Um, that's, that's how I would frame it. All right. Um, thank you both for that. I mean, uh, one thing I also want to highlight, I know when you showed the map about where uh, the programs currently exist and, and you know, which ones under the previous uh, program, uh, yeah, that one right there, oh, you just skipped it. Um, you, you showed which ones are in areas that were prohibited by zoning and all of that. One thing I, I, I want to note um, is, you know, some of the boards that did approve it in Queens, for example, board 13, um, I don't know where they're gonna vote today, but I know at their meeting they um, approved it. Uh, we don't see a lot of um, 
open restaurants. So I think one thing to, to really focus on, um, which would be helpful, is the outreach efforts on how do we uh, finding out where is the gap between the, the need and actually operationalizing it in those communities that if this were to move forward, um, that want to see it, I think that's something that that is crucial. Um, and, and wonder if, if there are patterns in terms of um, demographics, uh, you know, income levels in some of those communities as well. So I think that in terms of as, as DOT and the city is looking at this, I think a, a study on some of those factors is, is very much so needed. But I'll, I'll um, ask this one last question. Do you know how many staff, because I know um, Al, when you were speaking, you mentioned that starting with the director, and I believe it's two or three support staff before really uh, scaling up. Um, do we know how many staff uh, DCWP dedicated to this program? Because I feel like that in of itself will hopefully give us an idea of how much how many staff we should be starting with. Uh, that's a very good point. I, I do not know um, what their staff level was. Um, you know, that being said, you know, with the roadway component, we do anticipate more um, restaurants being part of this program. So we would, we would certainly have to build on, um, you know, what, <laughs> you know, what, at least what they had, if not more. Um, this is not entirely new because, you know, we do have a coordinated street furniture franchise unit that, that goes out and inspects every single bus shelter, um, um, newsstand and other uh, piece of um, street furniture out there. Um, and that's, that's a citywide um, unit and and there are um, I'm not sure exactly how many inspectors, but they, based on the, you know their their citywide rotation, um, that unit you know gets to see every single one of those pieces of street furniture, um, you know at, at least once a quarter, if not more. Um, so you know this is not foreign to, to DOT. I think I think we'll be able to to bring uh, the enforcement unit up. Um, to the right place to, to manage this. And, and I'd just like to add, because we made this yeah. point to the city planning commission today, you know, looking at this map right now, I think this represents actually the high water mark of outdoor dining that will occur in Queens. Um, you know, the right. process right now, the emergency program, it's free. It's eligible to everyone. It's, it's a, there's no, you know, no formal review process. And there's a strong, necessity because of certain restrictions on indoor dining or aversions to indoor dining. So putting back into place the, you know, public review process, they will have to go to the community boards for review. They'll have to pay a fee, even though we are doing a text amendment that makes everyone eligible. We don't anticipate that this many restaurants will be able to do outdoor dining. Um, for, for a variety of reading reasons. And, you know, those that we talked about a fee having to go through the process, but also, you know, with the updated site credit criteria and enforcement on clear path requirements, if, if they can't meet it, then they can't have it. Mm -hmm. um, so, right. you know, and there's updated guidelines to the roadway program that'll be different than the sheds that, you know, are, there right now so and there's also an added expense ben like of, of actually yeah. building something out in the street or the sidewalk that many restaurants probably won't see the need after they don't have to um, so you know we we um the dot will be you know hiring staff and we expect it to be you know and we and we hope restaurants take advantage of the new program in the future but it it'll probably be less than what is now so we we're hoping we can manage it they're, they're yeah, currently no, accepting. Them. They're currently accepting resumes. So if anyone here is interested in being the director of open restaurants, um, by all means. No, no one from my team raised their hand. <laughs> um, no, uh, but I mean, uh, Ben, to your point, I, I really think that that's part of it. Really looking at the map, and this is speaking in generalities. Clearly, when we look at each neighborhood, this might change. You know, if we start looking at demographics. If we start looking at income levels at the map, at least on the macro of what I'm looking at right now. I, there are certain trends that I, I feel like can, I can notice. I feel like there are some communities that maybe at a lower threshold in terms of income level where we don't see a lot of, um, you know, the open restaurants indicated on the map. And so when we start looking at the fees and we start looking at the construction of the pods, X, Y, and Z, if this were to move forward, 
you know, thinking through what would equity look like, right? So I, I think that um, to your point, I think you made it even more so, a need to ensure that the director and, and their team as they move forward, that there is this equity lens on how we're educating people, how we're doing outreach and whatever incentives the city may have, uh, ensuring that those um, incentives and those breaks and assistance are done in an equitable manner because that is the fear. Just looking at this map right now from a macro level, um, I see trends already. I mean, I'm sure some of the council members and, and chairpersons here also notice those trends. So um, th that is my point, um, but now I'll definitely go to any council members uh, who may have any questions and then we'll go to our chairpersons. Council members, any, um, feel free to raise your hand. I see some uh, some of our chairs who have their hand risen, but any council members? Hi, it, it's council member Adams. I just wanted to chime in on the, um, on the note and thank you for running this meeting exquisitely frank, by the way. Um, thank you council member. Uh, I, my, my only concern again, you know, was for the, uh, you know, for these sheds that are out here, it's really doesn't have too, too much to do with what we're voting on tonight as far as, you know, proceeding forward. But uh, as far as um, everybody being on board with these sheds between um, all of the agency parties involved with making sure that between Department of Buildings and Department of Transportation, that whatever sheds are on the streets of the city of New York that should not be there anymore, be moved uh, out, of, out of purview of, of, of our businesses, um, the streets and pedestrian walkways, they need to come down. So, you know, and realizing, you know, as far as the open restaurants, that's fine. We're going to do some, uh, some regulation on that, but we have some eyesores throughout the city right now. And something needs to be done about that post haste. So I would like to note the collaboration between uh, Department of Transportation and Department of Buildings, um, how we are expediting the removal of these uh, sheds that have no business being constructed in the city. Thank you for that, Council Member. I would say um, you, we, we absolutely share that goal. Uh, anything that is unsafe or derelict um, should be removed. And after working with restaurants and asking and issuing, issuing them cease and desist letters, um, we have begun to take um, some um, particularly egregious sheds down. Um, there were two that, that went down um in, in queens over the last couple of weeks so if there if certainly if there are some in your district or, or any others that you come across um please let us know and we will we will work to communicate with that restaurant and if they are unresponsive and the situation is is dire then we will we will obviously make safe um and and do so post haste Thank you very much. I know that there seem to be, there appear to be conflict between the two agencies as far as the time frame is concerned uh, and removal of these eyesores. Um, and I'm happy about our borough. We need to get them you know, removed. And I encourage all of our chairs, if you see anything that is up in your district, um, in your area, please let us know uh, that they're up and they need to be removed. I know District 28, You know, we have our issues over here also but we need your eyes out there to help us also as far as compliance with removing these sheds um, that are eyesores throughout our district. So thank you very much, Al. Thank you, council member Adams. Uh, any other council members who have uh, any questions um, that they'd like to ask and then we'll go to the chairs. Okay, I'll take that as a no. I'm just gonna say the order in which I have uh, the chairs and uh, their representatives right now. So folks know I have Eugene, then Michael Hannibal, then Vincent, and then Betty. Uh, so uh, Eugene, you're up. Thank you, Frank. Um, I don't know if there's so much questions as just some, um, we had our meeting and we, we one of the boards that turned it down. We turned it down with 10 uh, uh, reasons of why we turned it down. Uh, I think uh, the borough president's office should know that uh, one uh, 
special districts shouldn't be uh, potholed with uh, allowing things to go back into them. We made special districts in our, our city because we wanted it exclusive and we didn't want things in it. And now we're going backwards and we're now going to put a hole in that that dike and, and create a problem. So we didn't like the special district being uh, uh, compromised on this. Um, we also have a question regarding uh, DOT uh, determining the structures, uh, you know, sidewalks and street, that's that's a building department's problem. Uh, we have no problem with uh, a sidewalk. We understand that's DOT's responsibility, but a structure doesn't fall under DOT. It falls under buildings and they should be included in this program if it's going to go forward. And we told DOT at the meeting uh, with that. But I think uh, Councilman Miller said it even better at the last meeting, um, Frank, if you were on it, he didn't have great hope with the, with the uh, DOB, uh, DOT and the enforcement end. And uh, I can tell you as uh, the borough president created a special task force for College Point, I've been asking prior to that for their high cool, highway quality assurance unit to get in there and do enforcements and I get nothing from DOT. So now we're going to create a whole new subdivision to do the inspections on these facilities. And I have a serious problem with DOT getting that responsibility. So uh, I believe we sent it to the borough president's office. You should have gotten our report. So it was in a timely manner, Frank. Uh, we do have concerns with this. Uh, we do think that some of the things need to be refined absolutely for to make it a lot easier for them to apply and stuff like that. And we did agree with um, um, DOT that enforcement is important. And when a person does like three or four egregious things, they should be barred from getting that uh, that license for at least a year and a half because they should be punished to let them know that they that we had to send them waste time for DOT to go out and inspect them. It wasn't just like, oh, they blocked the exit. It's they did something gracious out there, Frank. And, and we felt that it should be an automatic. They shouldn't have to go through a tribunal or anything. Three shots and we pull a license and it comes down. So that was board seven. We, we forwarded on to, we just wanted the other uh, boards to hear what our concerns were, but we had 10 objections to this. And we also thought it should be daylighted uh, uh, for like a year or two, and then this policy should be removed. We want to get the streets back for the cause that we don't believe that you should be dining in the middle of the streets and stuff like that. Sidewalks, we have no problem with. That's part of their, uh, uh, that's really part of the city of New York was dining on the sidewalk, but streets, it doesn't. So that's it. I'm sorry. Thank you for the time, Frank. No, thank you so much, Eugene. And we and we did receive a report. And, and Al, um, you know, definitely we have to to follow up on on the timeliness of of some of these uh, things that our communities are flagging. I, I would just add, um, Gene. You know, I, I agree. You made your your board made a lot of good points. The 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 point about DOB um, in the permanent program, the idea is that these will not be structures. Okay, they 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 will not have um, you know the type of setups that we see today. Um, that they will be open and there will be much better sight through them. Um, so you know, I, I hear you, but the, the hopefully the need will not be there. Um, and then as far as inspections goes, with the guidelines that we set over the, the next year with, with the rulemaking process, this is going to be very cut and dry. It's not going to be, you know, multiple utilities. Uh, is it a sinking condition? Was it Con Ed? Was it National Grid? Who knows? It, this is going to be very cut and dry. We're going to go out there. Do you abide by it? Do you not? If you if you do not, then you are going to get violated. And, and well, I, I understand that. But in Flushing, I yeah. have consumer affairs that are supposed to get the illegal vendings off. And it's a free fall down there. And consumer affairs or whatever we call that agency. Now, when I had police, it was different. That's going to be the same situation with DOT. It's going to happen. I'm sorry. I disagree with you. OK. Yeah. And, and Gene, just one quick point. Um, you know, we, we talked about the difference between sidewalk and roadways, and I thought that was a good point. You know, the, the vote on the text amendment is just on sidewalk cafe regulations. Zoning doesn't extend into the roadway. So I just want to point that zoning is not the tool that will be, um, you know, determining who has a roadway cafe or not. And that, you know, we have a longer process. We're going to go in and flushing that out. There's going to be an announcement of an interagency task force that's going to work on these design guidelines. And again, yeah, just, you know, kind of echoing what Al said. You know, the point of having DOB, you know, not in charge of it is because we don't expect, you know, structures or enclosures. And I know that's what you see now. That is the emergency program. We are in the emergency program for for another year or so. But 
you know, we're really hoping this permanent program will be different. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, next, we have Michael, and uh, after Michael, Vincent, Betty, and then Renetta. Uh, Michael? Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, I sit on, uh, I work, I'm sitting on uh, Community Board 8, and I also serve as a chair for the state liquor license, particularly for uh, uh, the liquor license uh, applications. And right now, our application does have on there a, uh, uh, an option if someone looks for a, a side cafe, that is one of the options that they have there. I guess what I'm asking is that as we move forward right now, um, is there, will there be any conversation with the State Liquor License Association, particularly since these are on the street, open restaurants, um, and that may also impact like the capacity of how that restaurant will be serving um, liquor, uh, if that will change how the, the, the renewal process will work. Since right now it's, it was an emergency, but since more will be coming on, I just wanna know if down the road, if there will be a conversation around the city and the state liquor license in terms of um, on the street drinking. Yeah, that's a great question. So they, we do expect um, legislation at the state level to sort of extend the license to allow for there to serve alcohol in the outdoor dining that's so they have been doing that for sidewalk cafes that would go to the um, roadway cafes as well uh, i think this is actually a great opportunity that it, it's another check that the community boards have because as the restaurants apply for their liquor license they'll have to sort of tell the community board how they're using their outdoor dining and what their expected hours are. And so communities will be able to weigh in at that process, kind of talking uh, with the restaurants and on what they think would work and what wouldn't work and kind of negotiate with them. So, you know, that's kind of how we see that playing out. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Um, Vincent, I see that your hand went down. I'm not sure if that was uh, on purpose or by accident. So. I'm gonna that was you. accidental. Okay, awesome. Sorry. Sorry. You're up next. So I have two points. <clears throat> I think one of the worst conditions I've seen is uh, in Manhattan, 74th Street, west of 2nd Avenue. We have sidewalk cafes on each side, we have sidewalk dining on each side, and you have parking lane dining in this street on each side, and it's a tunnel for traffic. And it comes all the way up to the crosswalk. I think you need to pay attention and prevent that from happening, uh, especially in Queens, but in Manhattan, of course. <clears throat> My other point is that our snow plows are all geared to push the snow to the right so that any restaurant that's on the right side of the street that has a street dining will have to be removed and are you doing anything for that inequity to those restaurants? I think I, I can answer that second question. You know, part of um, Al's presentation, and, and we presented that to the City Planning Commission today, is that we expect the roadway dining to be seasonal and removable in the winter. So it shouldn't conflict with the um, uh, with the snow plow uh, operations. And that's part of why we're saying, you know, a lot of these roadway structures you see now, are, they're going to have to come into compliance with that, that they're more removable. So we expect them to kind of scale them back, especially if they've been overbuilt. So yeah, I hope most, that of, most of ours question. are wooden structures, by the way. Right. right. Um, so, you know, working with that, that there can be creative design. Um, but that they'd be removable. And it's not just for snow operations. You know, if Con Edison has to get in there and has to do anything with their equipment or DEP has to get in there and, and fix a water main line, like we, the city has to have the tools uh, to be able to remove it. It's, you know, we've been in an emergency program where we haven't had the revocable consent as the tool on what, whether restaurants, you know, can have access to the street or not, but that's how it's going to work um, in the permanent program. So we're going to have to have that 
you know, sort of language in there that, that they are removable. And then I, your first point, I'm thinking back to it now, we've, we've discussed this as we've been working on this process, does it make sense um, to have a cap on the number of restaurants on a particular block? We don't know if we would have a hard number cap on outdoor dining. And again, this text amendment, well, it, you know, it, we're saying we would allow more sidewalk cafes. So, you know, I think it applies to that as well. We're not um, sort of contemplating that there would be a hard cap by block, but certainly DOT would reserve the right for review to make sure that, you know, loss of sight lines, safety, access uh, isn't compromised at all. And we've been working very closely with the mayor's office of peoples with disabilities on ADA compliance and accessibility. And, you know, we expect they're going to be part of this design guidelines task force that will be thinking a lot about that. Um, so maybe not a hard cap, but that if there's enough restaurants already participating, it's possible it might be more difficult for ones applying later on if it seems to make the overall street unsafe or inaccessible. Thank you. Um, thank you, Vincent. Um, Betty? Thank you, Frank. Uh, more of a comment than a question. Just want to say ditto to what Council Member Adams said. You know, we definitely have issues with structures that need to be removed. And Al, when you said you've issued cease and desist letters to some locations, it might be helpful if you could provide to each of the boards lists of where you have issued the cease and desist. As Michael said, we, we do liquor license things. You know, some of those places mm. may be in the process of renewing their liquor licenses now. Mm. You know, it would be helpful if we knew you issued a cease and desist that was ignored. Uh, aside from that, Board 10 uh, did vote unanimously not to approve the text amendment. You know, we appreciate what the text amendment is trying to do pretty much we could agree with it. Our, our issue really revolves around the fact that the text amendment is coming first before we have you know, a fleshed out program from DOT. It's we're opening the door to do something before we fully have an understanding of what we are going to do. And I appreciate Al that DOT is listening and I would hope that you come out relatively soon with some clear facts as to what this is going to do. Because otherwise, you know, as we said at our committee, we're buying a pig and a poke. And, you know, we don't need to give something permission to happen before we know what the permission is going to allow. So that's just my comments for the day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Betty. Uh, next, we'll have Renetta, and after that, Brian. Hello, everyone. So can you hear me? So I just wanted to read uh, what Queens Community Board number three, uh, what our decision was. Queens Community Board number three, we held our public hearing on September 23rd at its full board meeting. The motion was to disprove the aforementioned proposal, which was passed 30 in favor, five opposed. Queens Community Board number three supports our local restaurants and acknowledges the serious impact that COVID-19 has had on their businesses. However, in review of DCP's current proposed open restaurant text amendment, we believe that further development is required. Queens Community Board three recommends that the open restaurants text amendment be disapproved because of the following concerns. DOT, DOB, and DCA should be working jointly to have a better handle on the oversight of restaurants. The proposed amendment does not mention how the rules policies would be enforced, nor whether sufficient enforcement personnel will be hired to oversee the implementation of the agency's policies. Will permitting fields fees be affordable to all small businesses? All sidewalks streets are not conducive for sidewalk street cafe uses. Has there been a study to determine the impact of reduced parking and how would that have an impact on our local businesses? And Queens Community Board cannot three cannot support the current text amendment that has been offered. There are far few too many issues that have not, have not been addressed or left out of proposal. It is suggested that DCP revisit this matter. 
We thank DCP for the opportunity to comment on the application and we look forward to working with the agency to come up with a workable solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renetta. Um, next we have Brian and then Lisa. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Good evening, thank you, Frank. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, CB13 voted yes. We had one no um, for the text amendment. We realized it's just a text amendment this time, but we had serious concerns, serious concerns and nothing personal, Al, about enforcement by DOT. Um, that's our concern, but we realized we'd vote for the text um, the way it's been presented, but we just, felt because they're parts of our board that uh, have problems with regards to noise. And, you know, unless you're gonna have the staff to come out at night, that's our issue with, with parts of 13 in the evening time. Um, northern part's not a problem, it's the southern part where we have a lot of noise with some of these restaurants, sidewalk restaurants. The police, when they show up, NYPD, they can just show up and then they turn the, they turn the music down and when they leave, they turn the music back up. So unless there's gonna, you know, we need more staffing, understand you're looking for director, but the staffing that's gonna come out at night, that's the concern for uh, CB13. We don't wanna stop restaurants. This is why I believe we voted for in favor of this text man. We wanna support our businesses, but at the same token, enforcement is key. And as I said, once nothing personal, Al, just that, we haven't, a lot of issues within 13, we haven't seen enforcement presently from DOT on certain issues with regards to some issues in our, in our district. And now we're taking on this uh, aspect now, and we just had concerns about that. Um, you know, we always, we've always been told that DEP is gonna be the agency to do the noise complaints. Now if it's gonna be you guys in conjunction with DEP, we just need to hear about the staffing issue. If it's you guys going to be doing everything but the enforcement of DOT, then you have to have the staff to come out at least at the night. If the structure could look good during the day, but we have a problem and part of our district in the evening time with noise. And that's where our concern is. We felt we should still support restaurants and businesses, but we have a grave concern. I'm happy that Frank even mentioned CB13 this evening. And I think he understands where I'm coming from on this. <laughs> Why well, mentioned 13. Um, that right. He understands and he didn't want to say, it, but I'll say it. I'm speaking for the poor. You know, we have a serious problem with noise and part of CB13. And unless, you know, you got, we need more staffing. Um, and one thing I can ask, let me just ask if the CFO changes for the building, does the license stay with the restaurant or do they have to reapply? That's, I think that's to be determined. That's a good, that's a good point. Um, not 100% sure on the answer. So you're saying if it, if it switches owners, if the if a restaurant um, switches ownership, Brian, is that the not the restaurant, the building? Say the building is owned by one person, and the and the and the license is there for that restaurant. Will that affect if the building changes hands? I I don't believe I if, so. I mean. If if the building changes hands, but the restaurant is still operating and the restaurant has been approved a license, then they would be allowed to keep it. The license is a is the, for the establishment. The business right. license. The business. Right. right. So okay. the business is a license, not the property owner. Right. Okay. And, All right, and, thank you on that. And, one, and Brian, no, let I'm me sorry, say, sorry, no, I was going to say, I, I never take anything personal, especially not from you. So I, I appreciate <laughs> no, that. Just, I mean, but, this was the concern. But, and and as, as the chief of staff just mentioned, he didn't want to say, but I understand where he was coming from. No, he mentioned 13. I, I, absolutely. It's so an what enforcement I was, issue for us. That's what the whole I, thing with regards at night. It's a very, very fair point. And, and what I'd say is, uh, no, DOT would, we, we would be looking entirely at the, at the site setup to make sure that it's in compliance with the, you know, the physical structure. I don't want to say structure because we're not allowing structure. So <laughs> just trip myself up, but the, the actual physical, physical setup, um, it, PD would still do noise. I'm sorry. Um, activity in, in the evening, um, DP still certainly with, with noise. Um, but that being said, if, if, if a, a restaurant is a problem site and, and it keeps coming back to a community board, uh, I, I, I think it's very fair to say it would impact their standing within the program. 
Um, and if we kept on hearing from the, from the 105 or, you know, or from your new precinct, um, then that's going to impact them big time. I, I think I'll take yeah, it back to the public safety committee it, for Al. Thank you very much. No problem. Yeah, oh, sorry, um, Ben. Sorry, just to add on that, these are really good points. Yeah. And it, having, you know, a restaurant at night is very different than restaurant during the day. So PD, you know, Al's correct. PD would go, they would, they would issue summons or, or they would warn them to turn the noise down. I think the idea is the setup will be, they will be able to notify, like there was a problem at an open restaurants that will go back to DOT Bro, as well as the inspectors. And then they will be able to kind of keep that on the license that's been provided to that restaurant. It's like, okay, they've had a number of infractions. They've had a number of problems. The way DEP is involved is they actually have noise inspectors and equipment to detect if a restaurant is exceeding the noise code. Um, and so, you know, um, they would be sent out to actually, you know, if, if to get recorded hearings. But the idea is that all of that information can go back to DOT as they're renewing and reviewing the licenses of the restaurants that have been giving out. So they'd be given a four year license, but they would look at it every year. Yeah. I don't want to take up everyone else's time, but with all due respect, Ben, with DEP monitoring the noise, we've had to use them in the past over the years. And it was a difficult time getting them because they're limited to staff. It goes back again, yeah. once again, to staffing. So if you're going to have the staffing for DEP and DOT, our issue with CB13 would be, once again, I'm just putting on the record, would be the restaurants mm -hmm. with the evening time with the noise. That's the issue. If you're going to have enough, and we're still supporting the text, but our major concern was the noise with regard to some of our establishments within CB13. And if you have the personnel to address those complaints, and that's all uh, yeah, yep. I have to say tonight. No, we're in no. favor. We'll go along with it, but it's just, we just have a concern. These are really great points. And, and we are definitely you know, thinking a lot about this when we're rolling out the permanent program. And I'll, I'll just say like, rather than get in the technical, you know, the idea in the permanent program is we'll be able to receive this information and then revoke a license. I'll take it back to everyone. Everyone yeah. had, we weren't too confident, but I'll take it back to everyone. Thanks guys. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Brian. I raised some really, really great points and, and some great questions. Appreciate that. Next, we have uh, Lisa, and after Lisa, we have uh, Reverend Thorpes. Hi, um, thank you, Frank, and, and thank you, Department of City Planning and DOT for the many presentations uh, and evenings that you spent at our community board. Um, Queens Community Board, too, uh, did not vote in favor of the text amendment um, uh, at this time. Um, and this is primarily due to um, it, it really uh, it really was rushed through um, without the rulemaking process being even started, as far as we know. Um, and it, it's you know we've had problems in this community board district uh, with we've complained about establishments and gotten no response from DOT or nothing's happened. Maybe you have responded, but we have no idea. And there's not been uh, a really productive dialogue going back and forth. Um, I have a question though, um, without uh, grandstanding about this. Uh, what about health issues and, and collaboration with the Department of Health? With food trucks now, you know, it's the, it's uh, the Department of Health and the police department and the DOT. And how do you envision, um, you know, this kind of enforcement taking place? I mean, right now, um, you know, it, it takes many agencies. It really takes, you know, a, a village uh, to proceed with enforcement now. And so I can't imagine DOT solely on their own is going to be the agency that's going to, you know, say, uh, you know, your license, I mean, in the end, it'll probably say your license is removed, but talk about collaboration and what you, you envision for collaboration with other agencies around enforcement. I think most of it will stay the same, Lisa. I think it's a fair point, but ultimately DOT administering the open restaurants program, it's going to 
strictly be their physical setup? Um, do they meet ADA compliance? Is there a clear path on the sidewalk? Are they within the parking lane on the roadway? Do they have the appropriate barriers set up? Do they abide by all of the siting guidelines that we have set forth in this program? When it comes to their food or their, 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 um, their license to operate as a restaurant, DOT is not going to have any role. Um, so that would, that would not change. It's a fair question, but our entire, um, role in this is going to be the physical setup of um, their open restaurant outside, either on the sidewalk or on the roadway. So can you talk about like debris and rats and are you going to offload that to other agencies or are you going to kind of pursue those? Well, it it would still be, you know, and Ben, you can certainly jump in. It would still be uh, the Department of Sanitation dealing with debris and and um, and waste removal. Um, And and certainly health's role would stay the same when it comes to, um, uh, you know, materials that are that are bringing on vermin or or other types of conditions. Ben, yeah, I I don't want to, I hope people don't think of it as an offloading, you know, one agency Mm -hmm. has to license and we're hoping to have a more streamlined review so that the program is accessible to restaurants. So they will go, you know, they'll go to DOT, they'll show their setup, they'll be approved, they'll be given a license. Now, once they're operating, there is a web of agencies that are overseeing operations to make sure things are working. And we really want that information and feedback to DOT so that they can continue, you know, does right. the business does continue to deserve this license? So you bring up a good point with Department of Health. Now they already have a process where they go in and give letter grades to restaurants that are based on cleanliness of their setup, the cooking setup. They do very thorough investigations of Um, sort of the dining operations and they provide a letter grade and they give them feedback on, you know, this, these changes need to be made to up your letter grade if they have too low of a letter grade. So the department of health has always overseen um, inspecting outdoor setups to make sure that's clean for dining operations as well. So they will be taking on the outdoor dining as you you know, they, they, they've done sidewalk cafes they're also going to be inspecting the roadway cafes and they're going to, they're doing that right now, actually during the emergency program. So we expect them to continue to do that. Now, if a restaurant were to have a failing letter grade, that information would get back to DOT's open restaurants team quicker. Like, you know, I, I don't know if it's immediate, but they will be able to get it to them, you know, right away so that they can determine if, if they are out of compliance with the license that was approved for them. So I'm sorry. So would you envision shutting down an open restaurant the way if they got a failing letter grade, the way they would shut down a restaurant now? Yeah, I mean, I because their whole letter grade it mm-hmm. includes the indoor and the outdoor area. It's not two letter grades. So if they're failing on the outdoor, they're they're failing overall. Um, you. you know, this this program, it's you know, we are balancing that we want it to be flexible for restaurants to use outdoor space. But it is going to be a lot on these business owners to to maintain that space. And they'll have to make that decision if it makes sense for them uh, participating in the future program. Yeah, I would just say it's it's an additional responsibility um, yeah. that they have. Um, and if they can't operate as a restaurant, then they it's not like they're going to have a separate space that they could instead use. Um, yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. So, um, next, we have Reverend Thorpe's and after that, Peter. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, I've been listening to all this being said and as far as the stance of Community Board 12, we are split straight down the middle. Personally, I like the whole street cafe, sidewalk cafe, let me be specific. Um, But to have it in the street, the curbside portion of it, I'm not really um, sure about that at all. Matter of fact, as I drove down the Sutphin Boulevard corridor, and I looked at the number of restaurants, uh, every other storeway from a, a Dunkin' Donuts to a restaurant to another restaurant. If they were in this, if they were um, side street side cafes, we would be in trouble because that would then remove so much parking. And then I looked at um, a few restaurants that were in front of bus stops. And if they're still going to be allowed 
to um, put cafes out on the street, seating in, in, in those areas, that too would be a huge problem. Um, like I said, sidewalks, I'm very interested in, but street side, I have a problem with that. And then on top of that, as Brian has said and others have said, and I think Betty said it the best, you're saying that there are other prongs to this to this text amendment. So again, we're we're going in blind and we're buying a pig and a poke, as she said, because we don't know what else you have planned down the line and it hasn't been laid out to us. And so you want us to make a decision about something that will reflect our communities, affect our communities drastically, and then we'll find out the rest later on. I'm not good, I'm not too good with surprises. So I would like to know the full layout of what it is you're talking about, what are we looking at, and what is the end game to this whole text amendment situation as regards to the restaurants? Where are you trying to go with it? Thank you. Okay, so that is a very good question. You know, the text amendment, again, it's really focused on removing geographic restrictions on who can apply to the sidewalk cafe. So the the vote that we are asking of the board isn't an approval of this overall open restaurants program that isn't fleshed out yet. It's that can restaurants apply based on their sidewalk conditions over their zoning conditions. And, you know, one thing we haven't really discussed tonight yet at this point, previously city planning had gotten a lot of requests from uh, developers, building owners for commercial overlays to legalize sidewalk cafes for restaurants that are operating in them because there's very specific zoning rules on who can apply um, for a sidewalk cafe. So we're not asking you to vote on the permanent open restaurants program. There's more work to be done, um, both on the agencies, there's more open community process that will be done in sort of fleshing that out and making sure it's a program that works. But for the text amendment, what we're asking is, you know, to send, you know, I think it would be helpful for these restaurants that are participating in outdoor dining. Now, if the, if the text amendment were not to pass, they would not be allowed to participate those two and a half thousand restaurants we mentioned in the presentation um, at all, simply because zoning would still act as a gatekeeper of who can participate in the permanent program. So we really want to just focus on sidewalk conditions and siting criteria most of that existed in DCWP's admin code rules. We're adopting that, moving that for the DOT. We're updating it. Um, but, you know, we're just kind of hoping to get the geographic restrictions. And some people feel the opposite of you and, and don't like sidewalk cafes or, or don't like it spilling out into the street or have other issues with it. And, and we hear that. And that certainly not asking you to, you know, vote otherwise. But overall, like if I'm to simplify it, it's that, you know, this will allow future restaurants to apply for the sidewalk cafe program in the future, um, as long as they can meet the and, criteria. And, and I would just add, Reverend Thorbs, that um, at, at no point will a restaurant be able to set up in the roadway at a bus stop in front of a hydrant um, in a no standing zone. Those are going to be very strict um, criteria, and they have been in the emergency program. We, yeah. we absolutely do not allow that. Um, and, and the reason is 100% uh, because of safety. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. Um, next After we have, Peter, could we move the question? Yeah, we have Peter's our last person. Peter? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll try and be very quick. Alexa sends her regrets that she's not able to be with you tonight. Um, I just wanted to share that CB6 voted in favor of the text amendment 19 to 9, mindful that it is limited in scope. Um, you know, some of the concerns that have been raised once we get further down the road and we're talking about a possible in-street program, I'm sure will also be shared by CB6. Though, you know, generally in our area, uh, it's the program has been received well, and it's, it's something that, that's brought vitality back to our streets, and we've been grateful to have it. I do echo Chair Braddon's concerns you know, I think CB should be honest, the CC of any cease and desist letters that are going out in these kind of programs. We should know what enforcement is happening. Um, and uh, Chair, our curious concerns about 
uh, once we get to talking about anything going into the street, we need to keep those corners daylighted. You know, the, this DOT has had a trend of trying to redesign streets so that there is better, there are better sight lines on these corners that protects everybody. And that's been kind of rolled backwards, allowing these structures to go all the way up to the crosswalk. So that's something that needs to be kept uh, at top of mind as well. Thank you. Awesome, thank you for that, Peter. Now uh, um, that we're done with uh, the Q&A section, we'd like to, uh, like, I'd like to make a motion to approve or disapprove. And we will uh, have the CB team go and uh, take everyone's up or down uh, vote. So moved. Hello? Is there a second to the motion? If not, I'll second it. Can I just say clarification? Is it to approve it or to? Yeah, sorry it? about that. Yeah, the motion is to approve or disapprove uh, the zoning. No, 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 no. no. You, it can't, you're you can't have a choice. Or, it has to be one way. So are you making a motion to approve it or disapprove it? Which That's the question. Sorry, a, mo a motion to approve it, up or down. Um, and no, no, no. Stop and we saying have to redo the motion down. if we disapprove it. Okay. Yeah, okay. A motion to approve it. Um, if anyone would like to make an amendment, they can make a motion for that. But right now, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Second the motion. Awesome. Sorry about that, everyone. Hello? Call a roll, please. All right. We're ready. We're going to go. Me, discussion on the motion. Discussion on the motion, Vinny. Go ahead, Vinny. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, it'll be short and sweet. I, I, I kind of agree with uh, what they were saying before about when we take out chapter four article and another one is not in place, then we're running blind. And I think that's very bad that we do something. I, I know you want to push the tax amendment, uh, city planning, but once you take one out without one ready to go, and we've heard nothing but supposition about how it's going to be done, what we think we don't know and stuff like that, that's not a final decision. So I don't, I really think we should disapprove this motion and vote against them. Another one is not in place. Okay. Any other comments? Just, just do, comment. do you want us to address that or no? We have, we have. Uh, Something's on the floor, so we have to vote. Yeah. Can we yeah. call the question? Before we vote, I point of Debate order. Point of we order, everyone, to... Betty, yes. Point of order. Before we proceed with the vote, in order to allow Board 8 and Board 6 to vote, we have to approve the substitution for the chairs. Thank you so yes. very much. Can we do that in one, or do we have to approve both? Well, let's, let's make a motion. Uh, if you yes. withdraw your motion. Yes, I'd vote. like to make a motion to approve the substitutions for board six and board eight, uh, and to make that in one motion, their chairs are not available uh, at this moment. I second, second that. that. Awesome. Okay. So we'll do Aye. 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 Nay. 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 Hold on, what are we doing now? Oh, we're not naying on the allowing the two chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Why? That's what I'm saying. Why would you say no to oh, a substitution for yeah, a chair? It's a substitution, oh, everyone. It's their, it's their vice chairs because the chairs were not able to. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Are you going to say no to a vice chair coming in? Okay. <laughs> Any nays on the substitution? No. All right. Okay. So we. On the, the motion on the floor is you call a roll individually. Yes. yes. You ready, Frank? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. So, Council Member Ballone. Are you still so on? There we go. You're muted, Council Member. Council member, you're still muted. Again, I just, this is Gene. I just want to affirm Gene, that. Don't the be jumping in on my time. Come on, come the on. motion is to approve. Is that correct? That's what yeah, I'm right. That's correct. The correct. motion is to approve. Thank you.
Uh, this will be coming before the council, so I'll be abstaining at this point. Thank you. Councilmember Peter Cool. She's still on the call. <laughs> <laughs> Don't see him on the call anymore. I'll be moving right along. Uh, Councilmember Barry Godentrick. In in keeping with my colleague Paul Valone, I, I do sit on the uh, zoning and franchise subcommittee and uh, on the land use committee as well as a vote on the, the, the whole council, and I will be abstaining as well. Thank you. Councilmember Adenique Miller. Well, um, based on the initial presentation uh, that mm -hmm. was presented before the board, and, and I don't think that there's been any information that changes or anything that has changed um, what we uh, discussed initially, and that um, I'm, I'm just explaining my vote. And uh, because uh, DOT and uh, District 27, Community Board 12, has uh, received an unequivocal vote of no confidence in the work that they have done, cannot support this. My vote is no. Council Member Adrian Adams. Uh, for the uh, items mentioned by my colleagues and as a member of the Land Use Committee of the New York City Council, I will abstain from the vote as this matter is coming before the New York City Council. Abstain. Thank you. Councilmember Savina Books Powers. Good evening. Um, I also, as a member of the city council and a member of the land use committee, I will abstain also. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Eric Aldrich. Uh, good evening, everybody. I will be abstaining on this matter as well. So my vote is to abstain on the vote. Thank you. We're going to go to the chairperson's community board one, Marie. Uh, no. Thank you. Community board two, Lisa. No. Community board three, Renetta. No. Community board four. Um, I'm going to say yes. Thank you. Community board five, Vincent. Four. Can you repeat that? Four. Community board six, Peter. Yes. Community board seven, Eugene. No. Community board eight, Michael. Yes. Community board nine, Kenichi. Yeah. Community board 10, Betty. No. Community Board 11, Michael? No. Community Board 12, Princess? Kevin Thorpes. Did she log off? She was on. The Thorpes? No, I guess we can continue. OK. Community Board 13, Bryant? Yes. Community Board 14, Dolores. At the direction of my board, we abstain. Three, five, six, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, we're um, just going through the count. Just want to thank everybody as we um, tally up the votes. Thank everyone um, for listening to everything, the presentation and each other's questions. and. Uh, DOT, DCP, there, there's definitely a lot of work uh, to be done um, here and, and fleshing out the ideas, not just on the zoning, but what, what the program looks like and, and really building um, confidence based on the comments that people said. Um, I'm not sure if, we're, if we have the votes yet. Um, no, I think we're almost there. So I appreciate um, But yeah, I want to definitely stress our appreciation to everyone um, five. who are able to come and be there, be here today. I have the vote if you're 
Ready. Yeah, ready. You have seven. Ready. So we have six yes, seven no's, and six abstains. That makes sense. Out with the Why negative. do you have different numbers than I do? What you, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. The abstention should count with the negative. Yeah. So we have 13 no's, six yes. Okay. So the motion uh, is did not carry. And we will close the motion now. Um, do you have anyone who seconds closing? Well, uh, Don't need a second to close. Oh, hey, hey, so much pressure, so much pressure. I'm sorry. You did good. Thank, <laughs> thank God for thank God for Betty and everyone. I, I was texting Brian and and, and some folks. Yeah, like, hang so in there, pressure. Frank. Don't worry, we got you covered, man. <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah. you, everyone. You did um, an amazing job, Frank. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Tell tell the borough president. Hey, that. <laughs> but um, but seriously, um, DOT, um, there's there's really just a lot of work um to be done here um in this area of really just building confidence, not just um in Queens, I imagine. So, but we do appreciate you and, and DCP uh coming, and um, you know, we'll see what the future holds here. Thanks, Frank. I, uh, could Thanks. I ask for a point of order? Yes. So. The council members that decided to abstain will be voting on this at a certain point in time, or will it not be presented to them? My understanding is it would still be presented to them. Any of this um, is going to come before the council. Yeah. Well, okay, so the the... The agency will bring it to the council, even though it was voted down by the advisory board of the borough board. Yeah, no, this is this yeah, votes that's across standard, the city. Yeah, standard. Yeah, that's correct. Thank Vinny, you. Vinny, they have a vote here, Vinny. They have a vote at the council. <laughs> but sorry. Betty, this is changed. Vote at our board and at borough board. They have a vote at borough board and at the council. No, we're right. we're just advisory. They're the one that does the right. vote. Right. That's it. Right. Okay. Right. But but uh, the point of information, Vinny, when the council abstain because they have another committee, that's a conflict. That should not be considered a no vote. Only that's councilman. Prob that's probably correct. But uh, councilman uh, uh, Miller right. is the it's, only one that would even count. without it, it didn't carry. <laughs> yeah, it, it still didn't carry. It was still um, it was six to seven. Of approve or disapprove. So um, either That's way, if we didn't include the abstentions, it didn't carry. And as they say, you got to watch what you wish for. You're liable to get it. So okay, Very true. it's always but, the um, to, to word the motion positively rather than negatively. <laughs> <laughs> but no, thank you, everyone. Um, we we do have another presentation, so I I want to um respect everyone's time. I know folks are still here, and um, so we want to thank DOT and DCP once again. Um, and for our second presentation tonight, we are joined by Asia Body, who is the Director of Public Engagement for the New York State Independent Redistricting Commission. Asia brings a wealth of knowledge from both her work and volunteer experience in public health and civic participation to this role. Thankfully, there's nothing that we have to vote on here. Uh, most recently, Asia worked as the New York Census Director for Engagement, an organization focused on Muslim civic participation. And prior to that, she worked at the New York Academy of Medicine, where she provided strategic assistance to neighborhoods, communities, and civic organizations seeking to address social determinants of health. And so we're excited for Asia. She will provide us with a brief presentation on the state's independent redistricting commission and will be available to answer any questions the board may have afterwards. Welcome, Ms. Body. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. I'm actually also a fellow community board member. I'm appointed in Manhattan, so I can't wait to we hear this same text amendment here and vote there So uh, to hear about it. So um, uh, as I said, I, I am the director of public engagement. I'm here with Miranda Goodwin-Rob, who's the assistant director of public engagement. Um, and many of you, we have started actually coming to some of your community boards. Some of those chairs do look familiar that are here. Um, and as what I always tell people, you may not have heard about 
the Independent Redistricting Commission because this is the first time that the commission is in effect. We are a product of a 2014 um, amendment, a ballot amendment that seek to change the constitution to create uh, an independent redistricting process that would be fair and readily transparent. Um, we are focused only on congressional, state senate, and state assembly lines. Um, and the Independent Redistricting Commission is made up of 10 commissioners, four appointed by the Democratic um, legislature, four by the Republican. Each of the four Republicans appointed independent and four Democrats appointed independent. The 10 commissioners bring a wealth of knowledge around voting rights, um, political science, and New York State to it. And their bios on our website can tell you more about them. The commissioners are tasked to submit preliminary draft maps on September 15th, which we did. And then followed by um, 12 public hearings. Those hearings are mandated um, in the legislature, in, in the constitution, which cities we have to hold them. So there will be one in Queens, one in New York County, one in Bronx, as well as we are starting in Buffalo. We're going to Rochester, Syracuse, and coming downstate. Um, the commissioners did add two extra um, hearings, one in Southern Tier um, and in Binghamton and one in Plattsburgh, because the commissioners felt it was important to do. And then finally, we are, um, they will be, submitting final uh, maps to the legislature in early January. So we're in a really tight timeline, partially because of the way um, the census released the data that they normally release in April, they released it in August. Um, and the commissioners only had a month with the census data before they had to give the draft maps. Um, while waiting for the census data to be released, the commissioners felt that they could not even do draft maps without hearing from the community. So we held a listening tour in August. You can watch all of those videos on our YouTube channel. Um, you can see, and they were done regionally. Um, they're really informative. And I think it's really interesting to see who came out. Um, and you can see like the Queens um, listening tour as well as the Bronx or New York. And, and we also asked for submission. So we had um, over 500 people sign up for our list uh, to speak at hearing. 300, nearly 300 spoke at all those hearings. Over 500 people submitted maps and written comments for over 1,200 pages of, of commentary and suggestions to the commissioners, which the commissioners went through um, for the draft. <clears throat> Sorry. And uh, finally, I just wanted to mention that the Queen's hearing is November 17th. Um, and we'd really appreciate your help getting the word out about the draft maps, the fact that we are asking people to let us know what they think about the lines in their communities and just talk and uh, speak up. Um, Miranda is here. If there is time, I know you guys probably have a lot more on your agenda. We can do a screen share of our website to walk you through, but um, the website is actually in, on my um, virtual background. Um, so if you want, but I, I, I'll leave it up to you guys if you if you want to move on with the agenda or just ask questions or, or would like to see the website. We can do the screen share so we, we yeah. can have the visual right. and then we'll, we'll Great. ask questions as we <clears throat> Thanks, Miranda. Do you want to do the screen share? One second, please. Um, okay, great. So I can share my screen. Uh, so hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, as Asya mentioned, um, our website is great for um, seeing what people have said so far and also giving us your feedback going forward. So um, on our participate tab is where you can send us your comments. Um, if I was logged in, sorry. Um, but you, you, there's a little text box that you can just send us a message or you can write an essay if you want. Um, you can send us a map. Again, that can be any format, a Google screenshot um, or something very high level. We, we accept it all. Um, and you can also sign up to attend a meeting and send us testimony, send us an email, or send us um, a mail in, you know, by post. Um, you can see our past submissions here, which we've organized by location throughout the state. Um, you know, check out what people, what people told us before we published our first draft maps. Um, you can read about our commissioners. And I think most important for all of you um, and everyone watching is our draft plans. So um, you can download the data for yourself to play around with, as well as use, um, the legend on the side to play around and look at our dis different districts. So what I like to do is just unclick everything at first um, and then pick, you know, uh, current congressional boundaries and then congressional districts letters plan. And then I like play around. Um, you can zoom in and you can see where the difference um, and this little data tab on the side will pop up to tell you um, just about dif different districts, um, population information, etc. So does anyone have any questions? Yes, um, I guess the first question I'll ask um, regarding the commission and its work, and thank you uh, for being here. I know um, we, we saw reports where there were two uh, ver uh, two different maps that were released, and um, you know, just wanted to get a, a, an insight on 
what that process looks like next. Uh, we know clearly that you have to present to the state legislature, but I, I imagine for many New Yorkers, um, it could be uh, concerning to hear of, the, of this great divide, which, which does impact us because we are losing a congressional seat um, and we, you know, redistricting will change, you know, who represents whom and um, which district that you're a part of. Um, what I would tell you is that, the, you know, the commissioners did release two draft plans because they felt like it was um, important for the community to know the different perspectives and have the two plans to, to re react to. So, I mean, they are committed to releasing, um, you know, a, a shared plan in January. Um, but I would say to you, like, I wouldn't see it as a negative. Personally, there's just two different perspectives on what the drafts look like. And, and frankly, the, the way the Constitution is written, we could have released one plan, or we could have re released 100 plans for people to go through. So, so I, I would say that just that it really is about um, looking at the, the maps and thinking about your own community of interest and where you live. And if this, if these lines represent um, where you need to be, and I'm sorry, I've got like, it's, it's the evening prayer time. I'm at my mom and dad's and they're, they've got these clocks that do, so it should stop soon. So that's what you're hearing in the background. So. No, no problem. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I don't have any further questions. I don't know if any of our chairpersons have questions. I believe all our council members um, logged off. No questions? The, I, the only thing I would say is that we've sent out a one pager as well as a public hearing notice. I think many of you guys have gotten our emails. We'd really appreciate you sharing it with your CVs as well as any of your neighborhood associations um, bids and all the different parts that make up your community because we know that community boards really are, you know, they, they know everyone in a community and they know all the different faith-based institutions and things. So we'd really appreciate the support. We don't have sort of the, the funding or the manpower that the census did, which has a, a large federal agency behind it. It is Miranda, myself, and a couple other folks. So we really would appreciate all your help in getting the word out so people know about the hearings. Awesome, thank you. Uh, it seems like we do not have any uh, further questions. So definitely would like to thank you, Asia and Miranda for joining us. We appreciate you sharing the work that you're doing thus far. And we definitely will uh, send out that information. Um, to the chairpersons, thank you so much for uh, coming once again this month, this evening. I know um, there's a lot um, that we all have to think about and, and, and you know, um, hearing from the agencies as well. I'd like to thank our entire team at uh, the Queensborough President's Office, Khalil, Maricela, Tiffany, our Deputy Borough President, uh, Rhonda Binda, Timothy, and our IT team for really making sure that uh, today happened. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Have a great one. Motion to adjourn. And motion Second. to adjourn, yes. Second. Second. <laughs> Second. Oh, eyes. Ah.